And it's with great pleasure that I introduce our next speaker. Dr. Guillermo Turney is a professor of pathology at the Harvard Medical School with an amazing wide background in research, medical imaging, and engineering. Dr. Tierney has over 100 granted patents and licenses resulting in commercial medical devices. He has served as a principal investigator on over 40 grants and published more than 150 papers in peer-reviewed interventional journals. With strong standards on how he displays and communicates his science, we're excited for Dr. Tierney to speak with us today in this next session. So without further ado, Dr. Tierney, over to you. So um, as was mentioned, I'm a pathologist and an engineer, and my career has really been in part motivated uh, by the book and the movie called Fantastic Voyage. Um, right now, as pathologists, um, the standard of care is that tissue is taken outside of the body, uh, and we look at it under a microscope after it's been processed and stained, and that's how disease diagnosis is given to patients. Um, but the fantastic voyage sort of opened up our imaginations to ask the question, well, what if we could miniaturize little microscopes and put them inside the body? Um, and then we could see these microscopic structures like cells um, that are the hallmarks uh, or the aberrations of which are the hallmarks of disease. And maybe even then we can potentially image the whole body if we can travel through it and do treatment on the cellular level which ultimately would allow us to, you know, cure diseases at a much earlier stage and save lots of lives. So this uh, vision has given rise to a field called microimaging. This is sort of my master slide. And the idea is to see the unseen and living patients. So right now you can see you, the imaging comprises macroscopic. You can do x-rays or CT scans or MRI where you see organ level uh, disease. But what I'd like to be able to do is see disease at the microscopic scale. Um, on this master slide is a scale bar that shows you different sizes going from 10 millimeters down to one angstrom. Um, and these uh, epithelium glands, nerves, vessels, nucleus, mitochondria are different features that you can see in tissue as you go down and increase your resolution to higher and higher magnifications. And the technologies that we've developed that allow you to do this in the human body and see the unseen there. Um, one of them is called optical coherence tomography, which images at about 10 micron resolution. At higher resolution, you can see individual cells. And this one is called spectrally encoded confocal microscopy and oblique backscattering microscopy. And then finally, even higher resolution and dynamic information can be obtained using a technology called one micron resolution OCT or micro OCT. Another really big advantage of doing this in the living patient instead of taking tissue out is that you can image the whole body. You can image entire organs with these technologies. So instead of just a little snippet of tissue, which may not be representative of the patient's disease, you can actually image the whole organ and find the area of worse disease. So first, I'm going to tell you a little bit about OCT. As I mentioned, it's a 10 micron resolution imaging technology. Um, one of the first things that we did with this was opened up the field of microscopic coronary diagnosis. So coronary arteries are the arteries that are on your heart that supply blood to your heart muscle. And when they become blocked, um, they can cause a heart attack. And prior to OCT, you really couldn't see the microscopic structures in the coronary arteries. And it turns out that it's those microscopic structures um, that are at the very root of uh, the plaques that cause heart attacks. So we built catheters. Uh, we uh, inserted them into patients' coronary arteries. This is actually data from the first patient ever imaged with this technology in 2007. Um, in the lower left-hand corner is a, a movie of images that are grabbed as the catheter spins um, and pulls back within the artery. Uh, and then you can um, render it in 3D after you colorize the different constituents in the tissue. And you can get these virtual fly-throughs of the coronary artery as in the lower right-hand image, uh, very similar to what was seen in the uh, Fantastic Voyage uh, movie. We've also explored the use of this imaging uh, in the gut. Uh, one of the methods that we have uh, employed uses capsules that are on tethers. So these are capsules that you swallow. They're about the size of a large vitamin pill. 
Um, and the tether allows you to both deliver the light that does the microscopy um, and also control the device within the body. Um, and so here's what a typical procedure looks like. This is actually the first uh, procedure done. It was a postdoc who uh, looked at the uh, capsule somewhat suspiciously, but decided to swallow it. Um, and then after a few seconds, you get these very nice cross-sectional images as the capsule travels down uh, into the GI tract. And you can see all of the different layers with incredible clarity. Um, importantly, uh, we can diagnose disease from these capsule-based images. Um, on the left-hand side is normal esophagus, and it has a layered appearance. And on the right-hand side is a precursor to esophageal cancer called Barrett's esophagus. And you can see that you lose a lot of that layered structure. Um, and that uh, is the simple criteria for actually rendering a diagnosis of this pre-malignant condition. And so we're using this to uh, screen for patients who might have Barrett's um, so that they can be monitored more closely uh, and catch cancer at an earlier stage. Um, the stomach is another interesting area. This is actually that same postdoc that I showed you before. Um, and this is digested food in the stomach. It's this beautiful swirly pattern. Um, and uh, you can see the stomach layer in the lower right-hand corner, as well as mucus in between the digested food and the stomach. Um, we also have imaged inside the small intestine, which is the next segment of the gut. Um, and these are the small intestine is lined with these finger-like projections called villi. Um, that help in the absorption of food. Um, and you can see uh, the dynamics of the villi um, incredibly as the capsule is traversing down the small intestine. Um, and it's really um, amazing that this kind of image can even be can even be grabbed, but it can be grabbed with a tiny little capsule. Um, this is a 3D fly-through, again, um, taking that data and then rendering it in 3D and virtually flying through it. It looks very spongy because of the all of those villi. Um, and then if you look at over here, you can actually see this is bile, um, which is a fluid in the intestine that is built up. And if we render underneath that, we see this opening in the small intestine called the ampulla vater. And this is where the, the bile actually comes out into the small intestine and also pancreatic fluids. Um, and like I said, this is all grabbed with a capsule uh, after it was swallowed and, and took the procedure just took a few minutes. And there's so many applications of this in terms of uh, diagnosing disease, diagnosing a disease called celiac disease, um, screening for pancreatic cancer. Um, and it's it can all be done in patients. It doesn't require sedation. Um, and they patients pr far prefer swallowing this capsule um, than undergoing a, a more extensive endoscopic procedure. So moving to higher resolution technology, I'm gonna talk about spectrally encoded confocal microscopy, which actually sees individual cells. And um, this is a typical um, spectrally encoded confocal microscope image. Um, and this is an enormous image. Um, uh, it's 100,000 by 100,000 pixels. So you can actually, like Google Earth, um, you can pan and zoom into it and you're looking now um, at the nucleus of, of all of these cells. And you can see the nucleus and the cell membranes. Um, and it's sort of like Google Earth body. You can look at a very low magnification and then you can zoom in to an individual house, or, which is a nucleus in this case, um, and zoom and pan and zoom throughout the tissue. Um, one of the areas that this is, uh, looks very promising is in a, a condition called eosinophilic esophagitis. Um, this is inflammation of the esophagus um, that's caused by food allergy. So you eat a certain um, food that you're allergic to, and these inflammatory cells called the eosinophils come into the esophagus and create damage. Uh, right now, patients that have this have to have many, many endoscopies. It's a real big pain. Um, it's very time consuming. A lot of these um, patients are children. Um, and uh, what we've been trying to do is develop a capsule instead um, that you can swallow and uh, that grabs the same uh, types of images that I showed you before, um, but not needing a biopsy. And so you just swallow the capsule, you get the images of the cells and you can figure out whether or not the treatment is working or not. Um, here's a, um, a patient swallowing the capsule. It's a pretty uh, simple procedure. Um, and what we end up grabbing is um, this enormous uh, microscopic image of, of this person's esophagus 
uh, in this case, spanning uh, 20 centimeters all the way from the stomach on the right uh, up to the throat on the left. And again, if you zoom in on any given spot, you can see different cells of the stomach. Um, you can see an area here that has uh, that's normal esophagus and looks pretty gray and unremarkable. And then an area where these inflammatory cells are there, and you can see these white dots um, that uh, characterize that this is a actually a diseased area where there's inflammation. Um, another technology that we've been developing um, tries to untether the capsule. So this is a completely wireless microscope um, that uses a, a, a technology called OBM uh, that essentially is a, a phase contrast microscopy technology that works in, in human tissue. Uh, this is the postdoc actually showing um, that there is no wires. Um, it's all battery powered and it wirelessly transmits data. It's magnetically activated, so it's put near this metal disc, which is a magnet. And it's now sitting on top of a phantom containing beads and you can turn it over. And these are 10 micron beads the size of a cell and we're wirelessly transmitting uh, images of those beads in the phantom onto the computer monitor. Um, you know, this kind of technology uh, potentially allows us to make the fantastic voyage a reality. Um, we can um, take these uh, wireless microscopes, we can control their position within the body um, and this is a, an example of a magnetic control system that can move it around the body. Um, and then we can uh, get 3D images uh, that we can put into virtual reality systems um, that will allow us to uh, you know, move the capsule around um, and also provide surgical lasers that can do treatment, uh, but not macroscopic treatment, but treatment on the cellular level. So the big vision is that someday this, this will come true. Uh, and we will have these, uh, you know, micro robots that moving around our body uh, and not having to open people up to do uh, surgery. Um, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the highest resolution technology that we have, which is called micro OCT. And that's a, it's an advanced form of the OCT uh, here on the, in the blue area. Um, and, um, if we compare the micro OCT images to the standard OCT images, we can see um, the incredible increase in uh, image quality and resolution uh, afforded by this new technology. So here we're seeing individual nuclei. Um, here we're, we're seeing cell borders. And we, this is a case where we're looking at inflammatory cells. And as you can see with standard OCT, it just looks kind of like a washout. You don't see any uh, of these features. Um, we've been exploring micro OCT in the cardiovascular system. So instead of just looking at mac, uh, 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 10 micron resolution images, we can get one micron resolution images and see all of these cells that contribute to atherosclerosis, like smooth muscle cells, uh, macrophages, which is a type of inflammatory cell, um, the endothelium, which is the cells that cover the surface of the arteries, and other structures like crystals that form in your artery and platelets and and we can get incredible detail on the, the uh, stent implants that they put in the arteries to keep the arteries open and see how cells respond to them. We've also developed a catheter that does this. Um, it has a special beam that produces a bunch of rings that allows you to get this high resolution. Um, this is a, a, a part of a coronary artery that has been imaged by the catheter. And you can see um, in the 3D perspective that uh, it has a very rough surface and these the roughness is because these are cells that are um, adhering to the surface uh, attacking uh, the artery wall and you can actually if you look at the cross-sectional image you can actually see these cells which are macrophages which are communicating with one another um, and then here's another cell for example um, that is another macrophage which is actually going after crystals that are sitting in the artery wall um, one of the neat things about micro OCT is that it provides insight, not just on, um, you know, tissue structure, but also dynamics. And um, this is an example where we're looking at uh, little structures on top of the airway cells um, called uh, cilia. And these cilia are like little uh, rowing uh, oars that are beating back and forth. And their purpose is to propel mucus out of our lungs. And you can actually see the cilia beat. Um, in, in micro OCT. And this is not possible to see this uh, with any other uh, technology. And this is in cell culture. You can see the cilia and the mucus move, but you can also see it in human uh, tissue culture 
you can see the cilia beating and the, and the mu mucus moving. Um, we've recently started doing this in the nose because the cilia in the nose tell you something about the cilia in the lung. Uh, and this is uh, one of our procedures where we have a little probe that we put into the nose. Um, and you can get these images of, of the people's noses in vivo where you can actually see these little cilia flickering on the top of the tissue. Um, and we can look at disease states, for example, cystic fibrosis, where the cilia become abnormal and the mucus becomes abnormal. And you can see all kinds of findings, like in this lower left-hand image, you can see the cilia are gone and the mucus really isn't moving around. Um, and in the, some of the lower images on the right, you can see inflammatory cells there, um, and you can see other abnormalities uh, in the mucus, which is much more highly reflective, and the surface is kind of jagged and eaten away. Um, another advantage of micro CT is that you can actually look at um, how molecules and organelles move inside cells and characterize and change image contrast based on the speed of the motion of the structures inside the cells. So if we take a micro OCT movie of a piece of tissue and we grab many frames over time, um, you can see that there's some modulation, like the, the image changes differently and at different speeds at different portions of this image. If we color code that um, so that, for example, red is slow motion or no motion, blue is medium motion and green is fast motion, um, we get this uh, composite image um, that actually has much greater contrast than the original grayscale image, but also the contrast is meaningful. In other words, it tells you um, what's going on inside the cell. And it turns out that this blue and green motion corresponds to metabolic activity. Um, and so when cells are metabolically active, they're blue um, and also green, but when cells are static or portions of them are dead, uh, the, then they show up as red in the image. So this is an example um, of that. This is the standard grayscale micro OCT image on the top. Um, and then you can see the dynamic micro OCT image, so much more structure is visible. Uh, and it looks almost exactly like the conventional histology that we in patho as pathologists normally use. Um, and if we zoom in on it a little bit more, you can see that the bottom layer is very blue, which means it's metabolically active, which, which uh, is actually true. And then the, it's still bl somewhat blue um, in the intermediate layer, and it, the blue sort of goes away at the top layer. And that tells us about how this tissue grows. The, the cells divide at the bottom, and they mature, and they die and slough off the top. And we're actually seeing this with the dynamic micro OCT uh, technology. So it's really exciting and it will open up new opportunities for cancer diagnosis and other um, diagnosis of abnormality of the uh, inner linings of the organs of our body. So that's just kind of a summary of what we've been doing. We have been trying to you know, make the fantastic voyage a reality. We've developed all of these imaging technologies, um, have made probes and capsules that will allow them to go into patients. Um, we're even working on wireless capsules that will allow us to see these cells. Um, and uh, I, I, I would say that it's all enabled um, through uh, the pipeline um, that exists in um, our lab where we invent these microscopes. They're huge and on a, on a big table with lasers running all around. Uh, we figure out how to miniaturize them and then we, we make these miniaturized components in um, you know, a, a shop that has all kinds of advanced equipment, including many different 3D printers and, and computer controlled lathes and mills. Um, then those parts are fabricated into final clinical devices in clean rooms. Um, and finally, we, we test those devices in patients here at uh, Mass General Hospital. And this is a, a, a great pipeline that uh, we've been using uh, in our lab I mean, it has the advantage that we can learn from the patient and then bring it back through the invention process and continue um, this in a circle. Um, so we have been using BioRender a lot um, and really excited about the program. Um, and, and this slide tells us a little bit about what, um, why BioRender is useful to us. Um, first is it got a simple interface to create professional, rapidly create professional quality conceptual figures. Um, it allows us to communicate science with minimal text. Um, it's easily accessible to a wide audience and 
Um, it minimizes discipline specific jargon and makes it easy to add your own images and data. So we're really high on this tool. Um, it really fits well within the way we like to visualize things. We're very visual group and we, we work with images a lot. Um, this is an example um, in a publication of how we've used BioRender where we've shown one of our micro OCT probes, how it's inserted into the inner ear um, uh, through this so-called round window to visualize um, the cochlea and the organ of cordy within the inner ear. And, um, you know, it's been a very effective uh, way for us to use the templates and to edit them so that we can show our concept in a, in a simple uh, fashion. Um, it also helps in grant writing. We've used this in many, many grants um, where we've used uh, bio-render templates, showed our endoscopes going inside the anatomical body um, and able to really describe processes in a single figure. When, when you're writing grants, it's hard. It's not like a presentation or a movie where you can show a process. But BioRender has uh, visualization tools, and the way it's laid out allows us to really show processes. And in this case, we're showing you know, how you would develop a new technology and use it um, to visualize inside the lung uh, with some of our advanced uh, imaging technologies. Um, so with that, um, I'd like to thank uh, everybody who works in my lab, um, my collaborators, and all of our funding sources. Um, that have funded this work. Um, and this is a, a photograph, a recent Zoom photograph of our lab. Uh, and thank you very much for listening to my talk. Uh, and here's my contact information if you want to follow up and get additional information. And I'm happy at this point to answer uh, any questions. Wow. Thank you so much, Dr. Trinity. That was a, a fantastic presentation. And I have to say, like the just some of that in imaging technology itself, um, particularly fascinating to me. I think uh, your work and and certainly you know the mission of BioRender speaks to the uh, the power of visualization to effectively and clearly communicate uh, science uh, and, and really any any scientific research. Uh, we actually missed your video for the fantastic voyage at the top of the and, and as as somebody who. Uh, has a personal affinity for that, and just and how cool is it that you get to actually live it out in real life after having seen it as a as a young boy? But uh, love if you could replay that video for us. And all right, here it is. You are listening to the sound of a completely new screen experience, a startling new kind of excitement. As 20th Century Fox plunges you into the most incredible adventure that man could ever achieve. So this is, um, for those of you who haven't seen it, it's a wonderful uh, movie from the 60s um, about um, a group that uh, shrinks down a submarine and they travel throughout the body to save, uh, save somebody's life. Um, and it really, is a, it really is a great science fiction uh, movie, but it also, I think, has really you know, sparked in a lot of us uh, our imagination um, and made us think that what if we could do this for real and how, what would that mean for patients uh, and society? And that's uh, really, it tells the story of, of, of my career. Wow, uh, so interesting. And uh, I mean, amazing that your work is helping make this a, a reality for all of us at some point. Um, really impressive. Uh, so I'm gonna field some questions for you now, if that's okay. Uh, we've got some coming in from the audience. Uh, Taylor asks, how much does it cost to produce one capsule? Um, the capsule uh, right now is still in the research phase. Um, and it takes, it costs, I think it's about a few hundred dollars in cost of goods. In other words, in things that you need to buy or, uh, and, and it takes about, you know, a few days for a technician to make it. So obviously that's, we're ultimately trying to get it way lower than that. Our target is around $10 per capsule so that it can be disposable um, and used by millions of people. Um, and actually that's one of our areas of research is to take you know, the prototypes that we have in, in all of these imaging technologies and dramatically reduce their costs. Um, some of that comes with volume, but also some of it comes with creative engineering. Um, and so we're, we're, we're doing that actually right now as we speak for the capsule. Interesting. Really putting all your into interdisciplinary backgrounds to work there. Uh, next question. But if it goes all the way down the duodendum, 
denim, uh, wouldn't it hurt to yank it out the mouth? Is there, you know, implications for the patient there? Yeah, I mean, it doesn't hurt to yank it out of the mouth. It's kind of surprising. Um, we actually don't have too many complaints. Um, we, it's done gently. It's done, you know, with some care. Like you don't want to just like yank it out. Like you sort of gently coax it out. Um, and we, we've come up with techniques that make it painless and the patients don't seem to mind. So there really isn't any problems getting it out. Interesting. Good to know. Next question. Uh, can this replace a traditional colonoscopy? Um, this particular capsule that I showed uh, today with the tether um, does not uh, go down to the colon. Um, we are developing capsules that do go down to the colon, and um, the goal of those is to replace colonoscopy. Fascinating. Uh, next question. How much does this much less invasive alternative to biopsy contribute to less disease burden in patients? As in, has anybody done the stats on the effect size of decreased procedure-induced inflammation on improved patient QAL? Yeah. Uh, you know, this is still a pretty early field. There are products on the market that have been generated with these technologies. Um, but I would say that we're not quite mature enough yet as a field um, to have shown a definitive outcome uh, measures in most cases. Um, this is a very mature technology in the eye. Um, in fact, the eye was one of the first places where in vivo microscopy or microimaging um, was implemented. And I think it's now pretty much the standard of care. Um, it's also getting quite mature in for coronary imaging because there really is no way to take biopsies of people's coronaries. Um, but it's also in the, in the GI space, for example, it's early. Um, there are startup companies that have products, um, and but they're just starting to get into the clinical mainstream. So I would say for most of the body, um, the story has yet, still yet to be told and the studies still need to be done to looking at the disease burden, the uh, patient outcomes, um, and ultimately the impact of these technologies on our healthcare system as a whole. Hmm. Thank you for the question and the answer. Is it possible to get color images on, on any of the imaging technology you shared? Yeah, I didn't show um, that today, but we have a lot of the same technologies that I showed. We've added video cameras to them. So you can get video camera images plus the microscopic images from the same device. Hmm. Incredible. Um, does this have to go through a lumen or can it access tissues without the use of digestive or circulatory systems? So a lot of the work is done in lumens because lumen gives you a convenient access. Um, but there are ways to do it in non-luminal organs. For example, uh, groups have implemented the same type of imaging through needles. So if you want to sort of determine where's the best place to take a needle biopsy of the breast or prostate, or liver, uh, you can put a little imaging device inside the needle. The needle can tell you sort of where you want to be, and then you can do your procedure, take your biopsy from that particular location. So one of the really big advantages of this technology overall is that it allows you to get microscopic images to determine where you should be doing your procedure or where you should be taking tissue from. And that's uh, super helpful and can be done uh, not only through the lumen, but uh, in solid organs by using needles. Great. Uh, how do you create a duo CT image? And that looks really cool. I'm wondering how to do this with some of our cells with Celia. Uh, duo d d dynamic micro OCT image. Is that what the, yes. Okay. Yeah. So, um, basically what that requires is to image the same location multiple times where each image is taken at a different time point. And we're talking about microseconds or, or a millisecond a difference between images. So you need to grab multiple images and then you process those images, each pixel then as a function of time. And you can compute like what's moving fast and what's moving slow um, and then color it based on that. So the trick is, is that you need to, to be grabbing um, the data from uh, the same spot over time, which is sometimes hard when you're imaging a living patient that's moving around. Um, we've managed to do it in the skin. 
Um, but uh, it's still yet to be demonstrated to do dynamic micro OCT inside, you know, organs that are moving around rapidly like the heart or the lung. Great. Thanks for your answers. I think that's all the time we have question, uh, question for questions. Uh, thank you for sharing your fantastic voyage with the audience today. I, I think it's clear from the number of questions that we had and the engagement in the chat that you really uh, struck a chord with the audience and uh, intrigued all of our imaginations. Thank you for that. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks, Dr. Tierney. Bye-bye.